tonight's presentation, Obsessed with EGT. Our presenter is Mike Bush. Mike is president of Savvy Aviation Incorporated, author for numerous aviation publications, certified flight instructor, A&P mechanic with IA, aviation maintenance technician of the year in 2008 and a member of EAA. Mike, thank you so much for being with us tonight. I'm gonna to turn control of the presentation over to you. Yeah, it would help if I unmuted my mic, wouldn't it? Good evening, everybody. Let's see if I can. Uh, I'm not seeing the, oh, there it is. Sorry about that. Let's see if I can grab some control here. Screen looks good, Mike. <laughs> okay, excellent, excellent. Well, we're gonna talk about obsession tonight. <laughs> little, little psychological stuff. Um, uh, actually, we're going to talk talk a lot about EGT uh, because um, a lot of people focus on it, but not very many people really understand what it's all about. So we're by the time we're done tonight, you're going to understand that really well. And Tim, I'll I'll warn you, we I've got about 85 slides here. So I've got a lot of material to go through. So I'll try to get through it quick enough that we can at least get some, some Q&A at the end. Um, you know, I respond to at least 100 queries from aircraft owners and pilots every week, probably more than that. And a, a dozen or two of those are always uh, questions about leaning. And most of the questions about I get about leaning um, are questions that relate to EGT. So uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of the kinds of questions I frequently get and how I answer them. Uh, the question, my POH recommends leaning to 50 degrees rich of peak EGT. A lot of, uh, of POHs uh, make that recommendation. Um, but your articles and webinars and books seem to say that I shouldn't do that. What's what's with that? Well. Most of the POHs for most of our airplanes um, were written back in the 60s and 70s. And back then, uh, uh, engineers uh, believed that uh, operating at, at 50 rich a peak was a good thing. And they got really, really nervous about operating on the lean side of peak. They thought that was a bad thing. Um, but that was... Uh, you know, that was 50 or 60 years ago. We've learned a lot since then, since most of our POHs were written. Um, and, a, and a big part of what we've learned, to be honest with you, uh, uh, we learned from a, a colleague of mine by the name of George Brawley, who uh, was, is the founder and chief engineer of, uh, of General Aviation Modifications, Inc., GAMI, in Ada, Oklahoma. Um, and uh, among his other accomplishments, George built the world's most advanced piston aircraft engine test facility uh, at the GAMI facility down in Ada, Oklahoma, and um, instrumented engines to a degree that had never been done before, and tortured them and uh, learned a lot about what was actually going on inside the cylinders on a, a microsecond by microsecond basis. I spent a fair amount of time down there at the test facility, and it's absolutely fascinating. I wish every pilot could have that experience because it gives you a, a, a tremendously increased level of knowledge about what actually is going on inside the cylinders and what actually is going on in the combustion event. But as a result of the the research that, uh, that George and, and now others have have done, we now know that um, 50 Richard Peak is the most stressful um, possible mixture setting uh, that generates the highest temperatures and the highest pressures and is probably the worst possible place you can operate the engine if you're interested in longevity. Um, it, now, to be honest, the manufacturers who wrote those POHs were probably not that interested in longevity. You know, if, if you and I have to replace a half a dozen cylinders on the way to TBO, 
uh, for us, that's an expense. For, for the manufacturers, it's a profit center. So I'm not really sure that when they wrote the POHs, they were that concerned about engine longevity, but certainly every aircraft owner should be uh, concerned about it. And I'm extremely concerned about it because I want to get the maximum life out of the out of my engines. So so I recommend against leaning to 50 rich a peak or anywhere near that area because near the top of my priority list is is making these engines live long and prosper. I'm, I'm not sure that's what the manufacturers had as their top priority. Um, but but it's I think what most aircraft owners have is their top priority. Uh, another question that I get a lot is when leaning my engine to so many degrees richer peak or so many degrees leaner peak, whatever it is, um, should I use the first cylinder to peak or the last cylinder to peak or should I try to split the difference because not all of my cylinders peak at exactly the same uh, uh, the same fuel flow. Um, and, and in fact, that's a very important uh, criterion is how close together the different cylinders peak. It's something we call the GAMI spread. And we have our clients run a, a GAMI lean test where we can measure what the spread is and find out how good or bad the mixture distribution is. Um, but in any case, this question about which EGT of the, of the six EGTs that I have on my six cylinder engine or the four EGTs I have in my four cylinder engine, should I be using? And the answer is shouldn't be using any of them. I, I recommend strongly against using EGT as a leaning reference. And um, and I will uh, I will be getting into exactly why I recommend against it. But I don't use EGT as a leaning reference, and I uh, try to discourage owners from using EGT as a leaning reference. Um, may sound heretical to a lot of people because EGT was actually first introduced to aviation back in the 60s, specifically as a leaning reference. But now that we know what we know, it's not really a great idea. Um, and if, if you, uh, if you uh, Google uh, Mike Bush leaning, you'll, you'll immediately get uh, a couple of uh, webinar videos and several articles that I've written that go into this in more detail about what I recommend. Um, but I'll, I'll be talking a little bit tonight about why I don't like using EGT as a leaning reference. Um, another question, um, you know, how, how many degrees lean of peak do you lean your engines? Everybody knows that, that, that I fly a Cessna Turbo 310 and that I operate at lean of peak and that I've gotten absolutely sensational longevity out of my engines, 230% of TBO. Um, so, so the question is, well, 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 how many degrees lean of peak do you operate the engines in order to get that kind of longevity? And the answer is, I don't have a clue. Um, I always operate uh, lean of peak, but I never use EGT as a leaning reference, so I can't tell you how many, uh, how many degrees lean of peak I operate. And to be honest, I'm not really interested in knowing how many degrees lean of peak I operate. It's, it's, not, it's not important. Um, so let's go back to some some real basic stuff. Um, uh, most most pilots know that if you pull back on the mixture control, uh, EGT will rise, and then if you pull it back far enough, it'll reach a peak and start falling. Um, but not a lot of people understand exactly why that occurs. So uh, uh, figuring out why that occurs actually takes you into some, some kind of interesting stuff. And uh, we'll go back to some real basics about combustion theory here. Combustion is a chemical reaction. Uh, chemists uh, call the substances that go into a chemical reaction uh, the reactants, and the things that come out of the chemical reaction the products. Now, in the case of our spark ignition gasoline powered engines, the reactants are the hydrocarbons in the fuel, primarily a hydrocarbon called octane. Octane is chemical formula is, is C8H6H18, uh, excuse me, C8H18. 
The reason they call it octane is it's because it's got eight carbons. There's a hydrocarbon called pentane that it has five carbons. There's a hydrocarbon called heptane that has seven carbons. I, I think it's C7H16. But the primary uh, hydrocarbon that we're interested in in aviation gasoline is called octane, uh, and it's C8H18. And so that's one of the reactants uh, of the combustion event in our engines. And the other is um, oxygen from the air. Um, and the formula for oxygen is O2. Um, air is about 21% oxygen and about 78% nitrogen and I think 1% of like miscellaneous stuff that we don't care about. Um, but at any rate, uh, so th those are the, 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 the main reactants to our combustion events is octane and oxygen. And the products that result after combustion, most of which is the stuff that goes out the, the tailpipe or the exhaust pipe, is uh, carbon dioxide and water, CO2 and H2O, uh, plus a bunch of heat, which is why we're why, why we do this whole thing is to generate that heat, which uh, that 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 energy um, that that our engines turn into mechanical energy and uh, turn propellers and generate airspeed. So if if we write the formula down for uh, for this uh, gasoline and air combustion. Uh, it looks like this, and, and that basically says two molecules of, of octane combines with 25 molecules of oxygen to produce 18 molecules of water and 16 molecules of, of carbon dioxide and a whole bunch of energy. And, and if, you if you multiply all those things out, you'll see that, that, that all of the different um, um, atoms uh, balance out there. You know, you know, there's two times eight molecules of carbon is 16 molecules of carbon. And if you look at the right side, you'll see that there's 16 molecules of carbon in the 16 molecules of carbon dioxide. And if you, you multiply it out for, for, for hydrogen and oxygen, you'll find out it all balances out. So this is the, this is the chemical formula for our combustion event. There, you know, a little bit simplified because there are some other things going on. The nitrogen combines with the oxygen a little bit and creates uh, nitrous oxide. But th these are the things we, we primarily are worried about in the combustion event. Now, if, if we look at the left side of this equation, this is the reactants that go in, you'll, you'll see that it takes uh, 25 molecules of oxygen uh, to oxidize two molecules of octane. Um, now, that ratio of 25 molecules of oxygen to two molecules of octane is not particularly easy for us to deal with because we're really interested in um, what uh, quantity of gasoline combines with what quantity of air uh, and Air is only 21% oxygen, and and uh, and octane, you know, molecules don't weigh the, the same as oxygen molecules. But if, if we work this all out, the the ratio that actually is more usable to us is the fact that it takes 14.7 parts of air uh, to one part of fuel to to get this. Uh, th this exact balance of 25 molecules of oxygen and two molecules of octane. Uh, and that's that 14.7 is by weight, which is the way these things are normally quoted. So it takes 14.7 pounds of air for every pound of fuel um, to, uh, to get this ratio um, e exactly the way the equation uh, wants it to be. And that precise ratio is what's known as the stoichiometric mixture. Uh, it's a little easier to pronounce after you practice it. <laughs> it's a funny word. Uh, but the stoichiometric mixture is, a, is the chemist's way of saying it's a chemically perfect mixture. Um, it's the ratio of air and fuel that would theoretically um, result in 
exactly the right amount of oxygen to oxidize exactly that amount of fuel. So there wouldn't be any leftover oxygen and there wouldn't be any leftover octane after the combustion event takes place. Um, so that's a stoichiometric mixture. Now it turns out that we can identify these stoichiometric mixture uh, in our airplanes because EGT reaches a peak at stoichiometric uh, the mixture. Uh, so that raises the question, why does that happen? Why, why does EGT reach a peak at stoichiometric mixture? It's a little bit complicated, but here's a, a, a slightly simplified um, uh, explanation of why that happens. If we go richer than stoichiometric, that means that there's excess fuel that, that can't be burned because there isn't enough oxygen to burn it. Uh, that's what we call a richer peak. And when we operate with excess fuel, the excess fuel that doesn't get, that, that doesn't get combusted um, acts as a refrigerant. The evaporation of that excess fuel acts as a refrigerant to um, cool the exhaust gas and lower the EGT uh, by evaporative cooling. Now, on the other side, if we are operating leaner than stoichiometric, um, then there's less fuel to combust. Um, and so there's so less energy is liberated and again the the, the fact that less energy is liberated is uh, re reduces egt so being either rich of stoichiometric or lean of stoichiometric will cause egt to to go down which is why peak egt uh, corresponds to the to that stoichiometric mixture so on, on at first blush, it would seem like this stoichiometric mixture would be a really good place to operate your engine. It's this chemically perfect place where the, the, the ratio of fuel and air are exactly balanced so that there's no excess oxygen and there's no excess octane. Everything matches up perfectly. Um, and although that sounds appealing and then there's nothing terribly wrong about operating the engine at, at, at uh, stoichiometric or at peak EGT. Um, it's not generally the best place for us to operate. It's not a terrible place for us to operate, but it's usually not the optimal place for us to operate. Just because it's chemically perfect doesn't mean that it is operationally optimal. Stoichiometric mixture is not the mixture that produces the best power, a maximum power if we wanna go fast. And it's not the mixture that offers our best economy if we would like to stretch our range or, or reduce our fuel costs. Uh, if we want um, best power, uh, that's achieved at a fuel air ratio of about 12 and a half to one, which is considerably richer than stoichiometric. In fact, it's about 100 to 125 degrees richer peak. That's what's known as best power mixture. And, and the reason that having excess fuel gives you a little bit more power is because a fuel air ratio that has excess fuel um, burns faster. Um, the, the, if there's excess fuel, then it's easier for, for the uh, oxygen molecules to find a partner in this combustion event. And, and so the, the, uh, the flame front burns faster and it creates um, higher uh, pressure inside the combustion chamber and generates a little bit more power. Um, the downside of this excessively rich mixture, besides the fact that it um, gives lousy fuel economy, because we're, we're putting more fuel in there than we can burn, is that, uh, is that it burns a lot dirtier. Um, because there are uh, lots of unburned hydrocarbons uh, uh, at the completion of the combustion event, um, the, the exhaust is pretty dirty and it tends to leave deposits on um, exhaust valve stems and spark plugs and places that we really would like to keep clean. So it's, 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 it's best power, but it's kind of a dirty 
uh, mixture and it it also is um, uh, not very cost efficient because we're, we're we're throwing excess fuel on the fire and fuel is pretty expensive um, on the other side of the equation if we want best economy um, that is you know the best maximum miles per gallon or um, the that's a that's achieved at an air fuel ratio of about 16 parts air to one part fuel which is considerably leaner than stoichiometric it's well on the lean side of peak how far on the lead side of peak varies with, with with various conditions but but typically best economy mixture occurs at 20 50 degrees 60 degrees on the lean side of peak quite a lean mixture and such a lean mixture is a very clean burning mixture um, so it's, it's it's good from that standpoint you can always tell an engine that's run lean a peak when you stick a borescope in the cylinder because everything looks so clean and if it, if the engine's been run primarily rich a peak everything looks pretty dirty when you borescope the cylinder so it's pretty easy to tell when you stick a borescope in there how the pilot has been operating the engine um, also, uh, these uh, this lean best economy mixture uh, uh, burns more slowly. Um, the combustion event plays out more slowly, and uh, it results in in lower peak pressures and temperatures in the combustion chamber. So it it's really good for um, longevity of of the. The cylinder and the exhaust valves it, it's it's you know it, it reduces the load on connecting rod bearings everything in the engine that reciprocates um does better at at, at, a, at a very lean mixture it's just a kinder and gentler way to run the engine um but we are sacrificing some power by by running it that way so you, you sort of have your choice of what what you're trying to achieve and what is mixture is optimum for you, but but most of the time peak EGT is not that optimum mixture. So, you know whether you want to go fast, uh, whether you want to go far, uh, whether you want to maximize engine longevity, uh, peak EGT is is really not the optimal place uh, to do any of those things. So that that kind of raises the question, you know, why do we care about uh, peak EGT and stoichiometric mixture and the reason we we care about it um, is because stoichiometric mixture represents a a uh, a tipping point, uh, the point where our engines transition between two dramatically different operational regimes. Um, operating the engine rich at peak and operating the engine lean at peak are very very different, and it's important that pilots understand uh, the difference and not a lot of pilots do. So the, the operating engine rich of peak, rich of stoichiometric is a, is a regime of, of having excess fuel. Operating at lean of peak is a regime of having excess air. And here's the really important point, and I, I wanna make sure everybody understands this. The amount of power produced by the engine is determined by whichever of those reactants, either air or fuel, is in shortest supply. So whichever of the two is in shortest supply is what determines how much power the engine produces. That's a very important concept. So let's explore that a little bit. When we operate the engine rich of peak, um, which is the the regime of excess fuel, if you will, then by definition, air is the reactant that is in shortest supply. So it is the airflow through the engine that determines how much power it puts out. I'll say that again. When we're rich of peak, air is in shortest supply. And so what determines the power output of the engine is the amount of airflow through the engine. Now, how do we control airflow through the engine? Well, we, it's really a function of two variables. 
airflow through the engine is a function of manifold pressure and RPM. And, and to, the simplest way to understand that is that manifold pressure controls how much air we can stuff in the cylinder every time the, the intake valve opens. And RPM controls how often we can stuff that amount of air in the cylinder. So manifold pressure is how much air we can, the quantity of air we can stuff in the cylinder and RPM controls how often we do it. And uh, horsepower put up by the engine is roughly the product of manifold pressure times RPM times a, a fudge factor that's called rho here the, to make all the units come out correctly. And the rho is you know, typically 0. 0.00 something or other, Depen depends on the engine, depends on what the rated power output is. But, but, but basically just think of horsepower as being proportional to manifold pressure times RPM. Again, manifold pressure controls how much air we can stuff in the cylinder, RPM controls how much, how, how often we stuff it per unit of time. And so manifold pressure times RPM, uh, it defines the airflow through the engine. Uh, and that's what controls horsepower when we're rich at peak. This is the formula that works when we're rich at peak. On the other hand, when we're lean of peak, it's a whole different ball game. When we're lean of peak, uh, that's the regime of excess air. So fuel is the reactant that's in shortest supply when we're operating lean of peak. We don't, we, we don't have enough fuel to consume all the oxygen that we're putting through the engine. And so it's the amount of fuel that controls power. It's the fuel flow that controls uh, power output. Um, and in the cockpit, we have one control that controls how much fuel goes through the engine and, and, and that's the red knob, the mixture control. So when you're lean a peak, it's the mixture control that becomes your power control. When we're rich a peak, it's the throttle and, and the prop control if you have one, if you have a controllable pitch prop, those are the two controls uh, that control how much power the engine's putting out. But when we're lean a peak, the power control is the red knob, is, is, the, uh, is the mixture control knob. And the formula for power output when we're lean of peak is very simple. It's just fuel flow times, uh, times a constant. That constant turns out to, to, to simply ver be, a, be a function of what the compression ratio of the engine is. So uh, uh, most normally aspirated engines that, that require 100 octane fuel, um, that have a eight and a half to one compression ratio. And, and, and so that constant lambda is, uh, is uh, 14.9 uh, 14 uh, for a lot of turbocharged engines like the one in my airplane that have compression ratio of seven and a half to one, that constant is 13.7. Um, if you have a low compression engine that was certified for use with 80 octane fuel, that, then that constant's probably something like 13.0. But, but there's just a constant that, that is defined by the compression ratio of your engine. You multiply it by fuel flow in gallons an hour and you get horsepower uh, when you're lean of peak. This formula is the one that works when you're lean of peak. The other formula, uh, manifold pressure times RPM times the fudge factor, works when you're rich of peak. And if you want a formula that works all the time, um, you, you can work both formulas and, and whichever of the two horsepowers uh, results uh, is the lowest is, is, is the one. So you can, you can tell if, if given manifold pressure, RPM and fuel flow, you can figure out what the power output is and whether it's lean to peak or rich to peak by which of the two formulas produces the lower horsepower. <laughs> um, and, and we actually use uh, that that mathematics in in uh, in, in our you know, our analytical systems and, and a fair a fair number of engine monitors um, have a display of percent power which is based on those formulas. So rich a peak and lean a peak are, are two different worlds. When we're operating rich a peak, 
Um, we control power with the black knob, the throttle, and the blue knob if you have one, that's the prop control, the RPM control. And when we're operating Lena Peak, we control power with the red knob, the mixture control. Um, totally, two totally different ways of operating. Actually, when we're operating Lena Peak, our engines operate a lot, a lot, a lot like turbine engines, which, which are effectively always Lena Peak. They always have way more air than they need. And, and their power output is always controlled by, by fuel flow. Um, and and the, the power control in a, in a, in a turbine uh, engine, flying a King Air or something, the, the power control controls uh, fuel flow through the engine. Um, where, whereas in, in our piston engines, the, the, the throttle um, controls airflow. It, it, it opens and closes a, a, a butterfly that, that controls how much, uh, how much air is allowed in, into the engine. So uh, the throttle is an airflow control um, in, in our piston engines, but in the turbine engine, the, the, the power, they call it the power lever, they don't call it a throttle, but the power lever is a fuel flow control. And when we're operating Lena Peak, we're kind of in, this, in, in the same boat where our, our power lever, if you will, is, is the mixture control. So <clears throat> now I wanna talk a little bit about a concept called the red box. That's a concept that, that uh, George Brawley introduced years ago. Uh, in his advanced pilot seminar uh, classes. Um, and we'll start by saying that the, the, the key to longevity, whether it's human longevity or, or engine longevity, is avoiding excessive stress. And in the case of our engines, um, the, the best measure of stress on the engine is peak internal cylinder pressure, or ICP, until internal cylinder pressure. Um, and operating the engine with excessive internal cylinder pressure is abusive to the engine, takes a toll on engine longevity, um, and, and keeping internal cylinder pressure um, well controlled is, is, is the key to not abusing the engine and maximizing engine longevity. And, and George introduced this concept years ago. Um, of operating inside the red box versus outside the red box, where the red box represents the area where internal cylinder pressures are excessive. Um, so here's here's a portrayal of of a red box for I think this was for an IO550 engine running at 75% power, um, where we've got mixture on the on the uh, on the x-axis, the, the left is rich and right is lean, and um, EGT on the in the y-axis, and um, the dotted line represents peak EGT, and the red box is centered uh, at about 50 degrees rich of peak, and it extends some distance in either direction from 50 degrees rich of peak. So you can immediately see that 50 degrees rich of peak, which is where a lot of our POHs recommend that we operate, is smack dab inside the red box. And to get outside the red box, we, we, we would need to either go considerably richer to get out of it on the left side or considerably leaner to get out of it on the right side. Um, but about 50 rich a peak is right in the center of where the red box is and it's where where we don't want to be um so how can we tell if we're inside the red box and how can we avoid being there uh, in a perfect world um, we would have internal cylinder pressure sensors in our cylinders and we'd have some sort of cockpit display that showed what they were and an alarm that went off if they got too too big and in fact that's precisely what they have at the at the test cell in Gammy. They they uh they they install some special tricked out spark plugs in their engines when they mount them in the test cell. And those spark plugs have internal cylinder pressure sensors built into them. And they're all com connected by a harness to computers and they plot this all out in the in, in the control booth of the test stand. And it, it's it's really, really cool. Unfortunately we don't we don't have um, internal 
uh, cylinder pressure sensors in our airplanes, and we don't have any cockpit information that dis directly displays internal uh, cylinder pressure. And it probably would be hard to do that because those pressure sensors are quite expensive and they don't last very long. And the tricked out spark plugs that they use in the GAMI test cell are not certified. So it, it would not be particularly easy for us to put this instrumentation into our airplanes, particularly if they're certified airplanes. So in the real world, we have to settle for a proxy for internal cylinder pressure that we do have in the cockpit, and that's called cylinder head temperature. Um, now, cylinder head temperature is not a perfect proxy for, for in, internal cylinder pressure, because uh, although the CHT curve and the ICP curve as a function of, of, uh, of uh, mixture have almost exactly the same shape and they peak right at the same place, um, uh, cylinder head temperature is affected by some other things besides internal cylinder pressure. For example, it's affected by outside air temperature. Um, it's affected by how efficient the cooling system on the airplane is, how well it's designed and what kind of condition it's in. So it's not a perfect proxy for ICP and it would be better if we could, if, if we had ICP information in the cockpit, but we don't. So CHT is what we, what we have to work with. And it's a pretty good it's a pretty good proxy for internal cylinder pressure. So, as as a general guideline for staying outside the red box, if we can keep CHTs well controlled, and, and I will define that for the sake of argument as being um, under 400 degrees Fahrenheit for continental or under 420 degrees for lycoming, uh, if the cylinder had temperatures are, are are less than those numbers, then we can be pretty sure that we're outside of this abusive red box area. And if they rise above those numbers, then we're getting into the abusive area where we don't want to be. Um, and so, you know, when I drew this, this particular chart, you'll see that, that I defined the red box as the area where CHT was above 400 degrees. This was for a continental IO 550. Now, the, the theoretically perfect graph would be if, if I could draw it with regard to internal cylinder pressure, but that's not information that, that we can work with when we're flying our airplanes because we just don't have the information. So we have to use uh, CHT as a proxy and, and this diagram is using uh, 400 degrees uh, CHT as as the definition of where the red where the limits of the red box are. Any place that CHT is above 400 in this particular diagram is um, uh, is uh, inside the red box. Um, now the the red box is always centered or around 50 rich a peak, 40 or 50 rich a peak, but its width varies um, if if we reduce power, let's say we reduce power from 75% to 70% power, um, that CHT curve would drop and the red box would shrink in width. And as we continue to reduce power, the red box would continue to shrink in width. Um, and um, then if we, if we pull the power back far enough, say to 60% power, uh, it would disappear altogether, and you know what what that basically means is that at 60% power, you could put the mixture control anywhere you wanted to, and and it and it wouldn't be abusive because the engine's operating at such low power that that it uh, it really doesn't matter where you put the mixture control in in terms of internal cylinder pressure. Now. Um, if I was running at 60% power, I'd probably run around somewhere around peak EGT um, because uh, if, if you ran lean a peak, it would reduce the power a little bit more. If you ran rich a peak, it would just waste fuel. No, no reason to run to run rich a peak. So if I was running at low power like that, let's let's say I was in some sort of uh, uh, surveillance operation, pipeline patrol, fish spotting, or something where I was just hanging in the air, not trying to 
to get any place fast and operating at very low power, then then that would be a reasonable um, time to operate it at, at peak EGT. Now, one problem with the red box concept that, that I, I don't particularly like is that it suggests that it's like a binary situation that, that you're either in the red box, you're outside the red box and inside is bad and outside is good. And of course, it's it's not really like that. The, the deeper into the red box you get, the more abusive it is. So I kind of like to think of the red box as having a purple box inside of it. it the, the, that right in the in the middle of the red box where CHT is highest and ICP is highest, uh, that's the most abusive area. That that's the really important place to stay away from. And and I think it's useful to to have a like a yellow uh, area ar around the red box that is sort of a cautionary area that says, well, you're not there yet, but you're getting close. You might want to think about doing something. So in this particular diagram, uh, which is the same 75% power for the IO550 engine, I, I've, I've drawn it where the yellow box starts when you get above 380 degrees CHT, red box starts at 400, and the purple box or magenta box, or whatever you want to call it, the really, really bad stuff uh, starts when you get above 420 degrees. Um, so I think that's a, a useful mental concept of, of, of the red box. That the deeper into it you get, uh, the closer to 50 um, Richard Peak you get, uh, the, the more abusive it is. So finally, this gets me back to why I don't like to use EGT as a leaning reference. Um, so let's consider what we have to do to use EGT's leaning reference. To, to use EGT's leaning reference to lean to, you know, 50 rich a peak or 30 lean a peak or whatever you want, you first need to find out where peak EGT is. And, and the way you find out where peak EGT is, is you, you have to pull back the mixture control um, until you can find where the where EGT stops rising and starts falling. That's the definition of peak EGT. And you have to do it pretty slowly because the EGT sensors don't react all that fast. So if you don't want to overshoot, you need to, you need to pull back the mixture control quite slowly until you've established where peak is. Then, then you can adjust to however many degrees rich a peak or lean a peak you wanted to do. And here's the problem. When you're doing this, when you're pulling back the mixture control slowly to try to find peak EGT, what are you doing? You're, you're going very slowly and majestically into the red box, into the purple box uh, until you get to, to peak EGT, um, which is exactly what you don't want to do. I mean, that, that's, that's abusive to the engine. It just can't be good for, me, for the engine. And in fact, we know it's not good for the engine. We had an interesting thing happen a, a, a little over 10 years ago that proved to us how bad it is to do this. Um, back in, in 2010 and 2011, we started seeing a rash, just an, an epidemic of cracked nose core insulators. That's the, the little ceramic insulator in the middle of a spark plug on champion fine wire spark plugs. Now, a lot of these cracked nose core insulators were in Cirrus's, not all of them. We saw them in, in Cessnas and in uh, Bonanzas and Barons and stuff too, but we were seeing a lot of them in Cirrus's and particularly a lot of them in turbocharged Cirrus's. Um, and here's, here's more a close up of the kind of failures we were seeing. This is a, this is a fine wire spark plug. And you can see that the nose core insulator has been is cracked. We're seeing lots of those. Um, now, having an, a cracked nose core insulator is pretty serious because it can result in a pre-ignition event um, that that can actually destroy a cylinder and put a hole in a piston and you know, mess up an engine pretty bad. So. We were taking these cracked nose core insulators pretty seriously. Um, and actually, after 
seeing a number of cases where there actually were pre-ignition events that were documented with engine monitor data, um, Cirrus issued a service bulletin calling for removing of these Champion Finewire spark plugs from service. And, and, and Cirrus had been shipping their new airplanes with these Champion Finewire spark plugs installed um, because they were ordering these premium engines from Continental, a platinum series engine is what they were called at the time. And among the other uh, other premium things that Continental was doing with these engines was was installing fine wire plugs instead of uh, their standard massive electrode plugs. Um, so Cirrus issued a service bulletin saying uh, we don't want you to use those plugs anymore. And they're, they're very expensive spark plugs, by the way. They're over a hundred dollars a plug. Um, and calling for removal of the fine wire plugs. Uh, Champion, I mean Continental stopped. Uh, shipping new engines with the uh, Champion Finewire plugs installed. Uh, of course, Champion wasn't very happy about any of this. That the, they were getting big black eye out of it, and so they actually came out with a service letter that was essentially challenging the serious service letter. I've never seen that happen before. And they basically blamed the. They 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 said, "Look, we've been making these plugs for for decades, and we haven't changed the." The, the manufacturing practices and, and the, the, they're made on the same assembly line they were always made of and they were made of the same material they were always made of. And we're pretty sure there's nothing wrong with our fine wire plugs. What, what's happened is that uh, these plugs are cracking because Cirrus is encouraging SR-22 pilots to operate Lena P. And in, in fact, it's, it's true that, that uh, the, 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 the Cirrus fleet probably operates more of more of more Cirrus pilots operate Lena Peak than than just about any other make and model of airplane. It's it's the way these engines are operated. Now I think that's a really good thing. But Champion was basically saying, well, there, there's nothing wrong with our spark plugs. The reason they're cracking is because these Cirrus owners are operating Lena Peak, and according to the Champion service bullet. Operating Lena Peak can increase the likelihood of detonation or pre-ignition, which will potentially cause significant engine damage, including damage to spark plugs. So we started digging into this because we, we were pretty sure there's nothing wrong with operating Lena Peak. I've been operating Lena Peak for decades now, and, and uh, uh, it's, as far as I can tell, it's absolutely the best way you can possibly run the engine from a longevity standpoint. But Champion was saying, oh, this is a really bad thing and, and it's damaging engine and it's damaging our spark plugs. So we looked into it. We actually in, engaged um, uh, Bill Brogdon, who is the uh, a retired uh, vice president of engineering from Continental, very, very smart aeronautical engineer who knows uh, piston engines better than just about anybody that we could find. And what we, concluded after really looking deeply into this was that it wasn't that the uh, engines were being operated Lena Peak that was causing the spark plug insulators to crack. It was how the pilots were transitioning from Richer Peak to Lena Peak that was causing the spark plug insulators to crack. And remember this, this epidemic showed up in, in 2010 and 2011. Well, it turns out in 2008, Cirrus switched their avionics fleet from Avidyne to Garmin. And the Garmin um, a prospective avionics suite that, that were installed in Cirrus's starting in 2008 had this, this fancy lean find page. Uh, and Cirrus was encouraging their pilots to use this lean find feature of the Garmin prospective avionics. And the Garmin and the lean find feature of the Garmin Perspective Avionics uh, required the pilot to lean very slowly to establish where lean a peak or where, where peak EGT was, at which point it would provide guidance as to as to you know what the final mixture to, to use was, which was normally a lean a peak mixture for crews. Um, but it was encouraging pilots to essentially dawdle inside the red box, finding peak EGT, 
And this is what was causing these, these uh, champion fine wire plugs to develop cracked nose core insulators. The, the, the procedure was putting the cylinders into, into basically mild detonation every flight. And the mild detonation really wasn't hurting the cylinders themselves, it was just probably keeping them kind of clean, uh, but it was enough to, to damage the spark plug insulators. And so this, the, these fine wire spark plugs were basically the canary in the coal mine that was telling us that, that these cylinders were actually going through mild detonation on, on, on every flight. So while Champion's explanation for the cracked insulators was wrong, it, it, it wasn't that, that far off. It, it wasn't the Lena Peak operation that was hurting the spark plugs. It was the transition to Lena Peak, this, this procedure that Cirrus encouraged using the, the, uh, the lean find feature of the, uh, of, of the Garmin perspective um, to, uh, to, to find where Peak was in order to lean reference to Peak EGT. So um, how do you avoid this from happening? Um, because you know I'm a big proponent of, of operating Lena Peak, but I'm not a big proponent of, of putting our cylinders into, into detonation every, every time we fly. Uh, so that, that's why um, I always transition from Richard Peak to Lena Peak. And, and actually the, uh, the advanced pilot seminars course teaches, teaches this as well. Um, by transitioning from Richard Peak to Lena Peak as rapidly as possible, um, spending no more than a second or two passing through the red box, going from, from a rich mixture, say, for takeoff and climb to a lean mixture for, for cruise. Um, and I refer to this as the big mixture pull, which is a term that George Brawley uh, came up with in, in, in his advanced uh, pilot seminar uh, classes. And it basically means that when it's, it's time to transition from Richard Peak for climb to Lena Peak for cruise, you grab the red knob and you haul it back real quickly uh, to, to pass through that red box area in, in a couple of seconds and not subject the cylinders to a, a, a prolonged period of operating in the red box, which is abusive and, and can put the cylinder into at least mild uh, detonation. So, you know, now you understand the reason I can't answer questions like how many degrees lean and peak do you operate your turbo 310? I, I don't know the answer because I, I don't try to find where peak EGT is. So I can't tell you how far lean and peak I am because doing that, puts you inside the red box for a prolonged period of time. And that's just not something I'm inclined to do. Um, and to be perfectly honest, I, I don't care how many degrees lean of peak I operate. It's just not, it's not an important number. What I care about is staying outside of the red box. And to do that, I focus on cylinder head temperature and make sure that my cylinder head temperatures are well controlled. Um, I also pay attention to fuel flow uh, because that's what determines horsepower when operating Lena Peak. And, and I have a, a, a nice uh, uh, shade and uh, uh, digital fuel totalizer that gives me uh, accurate fuel flow information for both my engines and uh, will, will tell me uh, things like um, Nautical, nautical miles per gallon, so that if I, if I want to operate at maximum fuel efficiency, I can play with the mixture control until that number is um, is is uh, at its uh, at its maximum nautical miles per gallon, which is by definition fuel efficiency. This the totalizer is coupled to the GPS. It gives me information like how much fuel I'm going to have when I get to my destination, which needs to be at least an hour. Um, so it's, it's, it's very useful information. Um, so I pay attention to CHT. I pay attention to my fuel totalizer. I don't really pay attention to EGT when I'm leaning. It's just not, it's not important to me. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that EGT isn't important. It's, it's immensely useful for, for troubleshooting engine problems. Um, um, it's, uh, we, we use it all the time and, in, in, in doing pinpoint diagnosis of, of, of engine anomalies. 
it, it's just not a good leaning reference and and uh, and now you know why oh so um <laughs> tim that's uh, that's slide 80 uh, 84 i made it uh, we wow. have a little time we have a little time for some q and a Wow, great presentation. That's I'm, a, I'm, I'm ready for a beer now. You're ready for beer. <laughs> a lot of material. <laughs> oh, not for the next half hour, though, Mike. You got to okay, no. take on these guys and their nope, questions. I got to be still sober for the Q&A. Yeah. No question about it. <laughs> we got some good ones. Chris says, couldn't lean of peak technique be perfected by including a mass air fuel flow sensor in the instrumentation? Um, yeah, there, there's actually. We've we've looked at a, a lot of uh, things. There's some really cool technology available in the automotive world that I think would be very useful for for us as pilots because it would be great to have better information in the cockpit. Um, it'd be great to have knock sensors in in, in where we're in the cockpit and stuff. And, and the problem with that is um, that if you fly a certified airplane, you can't put any of this stuff in unless it's certified and that's just a like a huge um obstacle to uh to innovation um if you're flying an experimental you can put all sorts of cool stuff in there and there is a lot of really uh cool technology available in the automotive world that i do think would be quite um applicable but um I think it, I, I think it's gonna it's it's gonna show up in experimental aircraft first the way things normally are right now because uh, uh, certification is a big giant flywheel that, that that slows down innovation. I think it's designed to do that actually. That's very frustrating sometimes. But but yeah, there there, there is there's some 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 great instrumentation that that I think would be very useful and. Um, you know, actually, it, it wouldn't be out of the question to to have internal um, cylinder pressure sensors, um, but uh, th th it would they would have to get certified, and that's just that's just difficult, and no nobody is n nobody's uh, incentivized to to go through the the cost and agony of doing that right now. Michael wonders, is this applicable only to fuel injection, or can you do this with a carbureted engine and an engine monitor that shows all cylinder CHTs? Well, every, everything I've said is applicable to both carbureted engines and, and fuel injected engines, and, and I'll, I'll qualify that slightly. Um, most Lycoming engines actually do a pretty good job of running Lena Peak. They, they, they have inherently pretty good mixture distribution. Uh, because the Lycoming engine's induction system is quite symmetrical. Uh, the carburetors are typically mounted right in the middle of the oil sump below the engines and the, and the, uh, the induction tubes come up like a kind of a spider in a, in a very symmetrical fashion. So the, the, um, the uh, Fuel mixture distribution, uh, it, it tends to be pretty even. All the cylinders tend to get the, pretty much the same fuel air ratio. And, and so they 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 typically will run pretty pretty good uh, lean of P, probably not as well as a finely tuned injected engine, but, but still quite acceptable. Um, most carbureted Continentals are, are less easy to run lean of P because uh, most in, uh, carbureted Continentals have their carburetor mounted uh, behind, at the back of the engine rather than in the center of the engine. And they have a, um, a runner and riser kind of uh, induction topology that uh, is, is quite asymmetric as, and, and results in uh, the rear cylinder is typically running lean and the front cylinder is typically running rich and uh, operating lean of peak requires pretty decent mixture distribution. So, you know, if you're flying a, a Cessna 182 with an 0470 r it's challenging to get that engine to run lean of peak. It, it can be done, but it's it's not easy to do. But most carbureted light combings run quite well um, lean of peak. <laughs> Casey asks, how do you know when to stop pulling on the big mixture pole? And procedurally, 
how did you determine the stop point? Well, there's there, there's a bunch of different ways you can do that. The the, the question is, you, you, when you pull the reg knob briskly, how far do you pull it, right? And and what we're trying to do is pull it to a to a nice, safe Lena Peak mixture where we can kind of let everything stabilize and then fine tune things a little bit after that. Um, you can do the big mixture pull without any reference to any instrumentation at all if you want to. Um, one way to do it is 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 to just pull it until you until you feel the engine start to lose power. Um, and by definition, when the engine starts to lose power, you are Lena Peak um, because horsepower varies very very little with fuel flow when you're Richard Peak, you know, as we said, that power is, is a function of, of mass airflow when you're Richard Peak. But once you transition to Lena Peak, um, power varies linearly with fuel flow. It decreases linearly as fuel flow decreases. So if you just pull the red knob back until you start to feel the engine lose a little bit of power, you, you know you're Lena Peak and, 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 and you've, you, your big mixture pull has been successful. Um, Another way to do it, which isn't quite as elegant, <laughs> is that if you pull it back until the engine starts running rough, you're definitely Lena Peak. Now, um, I, I wouldn't do it that way, you, you know, if, if your significant other was in the right seat. If, if somebody asks you what was that, then that's not cool. Um, and then the, the finally, after you've done this for a while and you get a pretty good idea of what fuel flow will put you in a good Lena Peak area at various altitudes, uh, you can lean to fuel flow, assuming that you have an accurate fuel flow gauge. So there are various ways of doing it, but you don't, you don't necessarily even have to look at any instruments to do the big mixture pull. You can just pull, pull the knob out until you start feeling, you'll, you'll hear and feel that the engine has lost little power and that tells you that you're Lena Peak. James asks, my EFIS has a caution and warning temperature limit for the EGTs. Is this really meaningless? I get a caution at 1400. Should I even have limits designated? Um, if we're talking about true EGT, which are probes that are mounted right near the exhaust ports, um, I, I wouldn't I, I wouldn't have a, any kind of alarm limits for those. Um, they're, they're, the, the EGT that's measured that way is is not a real gas temperature. It doesn't mean anything, and and having high EGT doesn't hurt anything. It, now it's it, it can be um, uh, diagnostically interesting information. For for example, um, if one of the two spark plugs in a in a cylinder stops firing because it has gotten lead fouled or fouled with some with oil or something, um, the EGT in that cylinder will jump up 50 to 100 degrees uh, above what it was before and probably above what the other cylinders are. And um, knowing that is probably useful um, because you'll look and say, oh, I think maybe one of my spark plugs is in, in firing, and then you can do an in-flight uh, mag check and verify whether that's the case or not. Um, so, you know, what is useful, uh, and and that 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 cert some engine monitors have, is an alarm that goes off if the if the spread between the maximum and minimum EGT exceeds a certain value. It basically, th that alarm typically goes off if you have some outlier cylinder that wh whose EGT is markedly different than the others, and, and that's probably something you want to you want to know about. So that's probably worth having an alarm. But having an alarm for for absolute EGT value doesn't make a lot of sense. Now, on the other hand, if if what we're measuring is is more like TIT, where it's a probe that's mounted way downstream. Um, we're in the exhaust where all of the cylinders have come together. 
then that is a real temperature and that might be worth having an alarm. Certainly, uh, if you have a turbocharged airplane, you almost always have a TIT probe and there is a TIT red line that we, that we observe that is there to protect the turbocharger. And so, it, so we normally would set an alarm for TIT, but an absolute uh, value alarm for EGT is, is probably not particularly meaningful. And I would probably turn it off if, if, if that was possible. Wayne asks, should I run Lena Peak flying at lower altitudes below 3,000 or 4,000 foot MSL? Why not? <laughs> Why not? Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you know, just just uh, just to 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 put a sharp point on it, uh, I fly a turbocharged airplane. Uh, turbocharged airplanes have a system called a turbo system whose function is to fool the engine into thinking it's at sea level, regardless of what altitude the, the airplane's flying. So my engines always think they're at sea level. They always operate at 32 inches of manifold pressure. It doesn't matter whether I'm at 20,000 feet or 1,000 feet, they, they, they see this, the same manifold pressure. And, and I always operate Lena Peak. So effectively I'm operating Lena Peak at what the engine thinks is sea level. So absolutely, of course you should, should operate Lena Peak at low altitudes. Barry asks, doesn't GAMI lean test cause spending a large period of time in the red box? Uh, it does. And that's why we recommend doing the GAMI lean test at fairly low power, 65% uh, power or less, uh, so, that, uh, so, that it's, so that it's not abusive. I, I certainly wouldn't recommend doing a GAMI lean test at 75% power because, the, the, as you say, you, that it does. You do spend a long, a long time, uh, for, uh, you, you know, going through that that general area um, on the rich side of peak when you're doing a GAMI lean test because it involves slow mixture sweeps. So the best, the, the way we recommend doing GAMI lean test is to do it at low power, where the red box has more or less gone away. Brian wonders, how does outside air temperature correlate to cylinder head temperature at constant ICP? In other words, if it is um, minus 20, would CHT be 20 lower at the same ICP or some other ratio of outside air temperature change to CHT change? Um, I, I don't know an exact answer to that. It's a very good question. It, uh, I, I know that it, that that it has a relatively minor effect. Uh, it's certainly not one degree per one degree. Um, uh, what I generally recommend is ignoring, for, for the purposes of, of thinking about the red box, I generally advise ignoring um, outside air temperature uh, unless the outside air temperature is cold, it's be below ISA standard, in which case you, you might want to drop your your uh, maximum CHT targets a little bit. But but it's it's you you, you wouldn't drop them a lot, and, and 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 if the if the OAT is not really cold, uh, I I would pretty much ignore uh, outside air temperature. Uh, Bryden wonders, generally, how much lag difference is there between EGT and CHT when mixture changes are made? Uh, CHT reacts very slowly uh, because the, the, the cylinder head is, it has a huge thermal mass to it, and, and it takes a long time for, uh, for the temperature to change. Uh, EGT reacts a lot faster than CHT, but it still doesn't re react as fast as we would like like it to, and and that's why, in order to establish where peak EGT is without overshooting, we we have to uh, lean the mixture fairly slowly uh, while we're watching it to see when it stops going up and starts going back down again, or why or while our instrumentation is watching that, because otherwise we'll overshoot peak by quite a bit. Uh, but CHT reacts quite slowly, which is why um, once once you do the big mixture pull, I, I recommend 
waiting a minute or two and letting everything stabilize before looking at to see what CHTs are and deciding whether you, you want to enrich in the mixture a little bit to get a little bit more power or or what because uh, it's a it's it's very slow reacting. Daniel wonders what mixture operation should I use when operating Lena Peak and beginning the descent? Um, if it's a normally aspirated engine and doesn't have a, a, a an altitude compensating fuel system, which most engines don't have, um, you are going to have to rich in the engine as you descend because um, as as you're descending the the engine is um, is uh, breathing more uh, dense air and it's so it's going to need a little bit more fuel to maintain a constant mixture um, One good way of doing that, or uh, one reasonable way of doing that in in the descent, is to is to keep an eye on exhaust gas temperature, and 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 richen as necessary to keep it approximately constant as you're going down. If you forget to uh, enrich in in the descent, it's not a big problem because the engine will ultimately remind you if if you. If you don't richen in the descent, uh, as you descend, eventually the engine will get lean, lean enough that it will start running rough and you'll say, oh yeah, I forgot. And you'll push the mixture control in a little bit to re restore its smooth operation. And there's nothing wrong with that, that's fine. Uh, but if you wanna do a little bit more elegantly, um, you can keep an eye on exhaust gas temperature and try to keep it a, a roughly constant in the descent. Andrew says, you've seen a million engines and cylinders. Can you put to bed the age old question, is shock cooling a myth or real? Uh, interesting. Yeah, I, I actually can, can I learned quite a bit about that because back in, back in the old days, I, I had drunk the Kool-Aid about shock cooling. <laughs> well, we didn't know any better. And, and I was one of those guys that was very careful about reducing you know two inches every two minutes of manifold pressure and stuff and then i installed an engine monitor which actually uh computed the the cylinder cool down rate and what i discovered was it was very very hard to to generate an excessive uh cool down rate um i i have my uh engine monitor uh, set to alarm anytime the cool down rate is more than 30 degrees per minute, um, which is like half the, the the cool down rate that that Lycoming specifies uh, as as the maximum they want to see. So it's pretty conservative, and it 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 pro that that alarm that 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 cool down alarm has probably gone off you know, on an average of once every five years or something. It, it just doesn't happen very often. If you do a, you know, an extreme slam dunk maneuver where you go from, from high power to pulling the throttle all the way back to idle because ATC did something crazy and, and, and you decided to try to do it, um, you can get a, a, a cool down alarm, but it's not easy to do. So nowadays, I, I don't do the two inches every two minutes thing anymore. I'll, I'll yank manifold pressure back five inches at a time and, and, and the alarm never goes off. So I guess the way I would say it is that, that shock cooling is not completely a myth, but it's very rare and it's not easy to, to, to shock cool an engine. It takes a very abusive kind of power reduction, a very, very rapid power reduction from from a high high power setting to a very low power setting very suddenly. And in in general, um, engine control should not be moved suddenly. Uh, you know, when I'm cleared for takeoff, I don't jam the throttles to the stops. I push them forward slowly. Uh, in, in, in general, it's a good idea to move engine control slowly and not to, to, to jam them one way or the other. If you do that, you, you probably never 
we never get a any anything approaching a shock cooling situation. Unless it's the big mixture pole. No, that well, unless you pulled it all the way to idle cutoff, that would probably do it. But yeah, the big mixture pull doesn't does, doesn't really um, make anything dramatic um, happen. It it just gets you through an area you don't want to be in. Joseph wonders: Does Lena Peak operation remain the same when breaking in an engine or a cylinder? Um, in other words, I, I should you run Lena Peak when you're breaking in a new engine? I would generally say don't don't operate Lena Peak for the first couple of hours when you're breaking in new cylinders. Um, you know, as I said, operating Lena Peak is a sort of a kinder, gentler situation where the where maximum ICPs are lower and and the combustion event plays out in a in a slower, gentler fashion. Uh, and that's exactly what you don't want during break-in. You, you want maximum internal cylinder pressure. You're, you're, you're trying to generate metal-to-metal -metal contact. It's exactly the opposite of what you're trying to do during the whole rest of the engine life, which is avoid metal-to-metal -metal contact and avoid wear. But during, the, during that first couple hours of break-in time, you, you're actually trying to to get metal to metal contact between the, the, the piston rings and the cylinder walls in order to smooth smooth off the sharp edges of the of, of the hone uh, the cross hatch pattern that was honed into the cylinder. So you, you really you really want maximum ICP and and um, you know I, I I did a webinar on on break in and basically I recommend operating as close to 100 percent power as you can without over temping the engine. Um, and, and if you do that, the break-in should normally not take much more than an hour or so. It, 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 you just want to run it really, really hard for, for about an hour, and, and, and then you can go back to operating it in more normal fashion. Oliver says, assuming I use fuel flow as the guide for leaning, how do I determine the optimal flow for a given power setting? Um, I, I guess I don't really understand the the question because the the fuel flow. If we're talking about Lena Peak, you'll, the fuel flow defines what the power setting is. The, the the power is fuel flow times lambda, where lambda is you know 14.9 or whatever it is for your engine. So I'm not sure that what the, the question saying. How, how do I what what fuel flow is for? optimal for a particular power setting. Fuel flow defines the power setting. Chal wonders, does operating your engine over square or under square affect the red box or Lena Peak, Richard Peak operation? Um, not significantly. Um, uh, op operating in, um, over square or under square is, is it's primarily a a rich a peak phenomenon because it has to do with the relationship of manifold pressure and RPM and those are the two things that that define power when you're rich a peak when you're lean a peak it 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 it, uh, it, it basically is irrelevant and when I when I fly my airplane um, I go to full throttle on takeoff and 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 I just leave the throttle full throttle for the whole flight. The only time I pull the throttle back is when I want to go land the airplane because I haven't figured out how to land the airplane at full throttle yet. But um, it just you know, remember that once you go lean a peak, the, the throttle isn't your power control anymore. It's the mixture control that's your power control. So I just leave the throttle all the way in the whole flight. And people say, oh my God, that must be terrible for the engine. Well, my, my engines went to 230% of TBO, so it can't be that terrible for the engine. <laughs> But it surprises a lot of people who fly with me to see how I fly it. Jay asks, is it the same Lena Peak recommendation if you have electronic ignition that adjusts timing, reference RPM, and manifold pressure? Um, let me think about that for a minute. Um, The the 
Yeah, I, I, I don't think there'd be any, there's any difference in, in, in the recommendation. The, the electronic ignition systems typically use a manifold pressure sensor and will advance the timing at low manifold pressures. Um, so typically if you're cruising at a, at a higher altitude where the manifold pressure is reduced, uh, it, it will advance the timing. And, and that will result in, in somewhat higher cylinder head temperatures, um, which is reflective of higher internal uh, cylinder pressures. Um, it, it's, it's um, you know, there's, there's no free lunch in aviation. And what that, that variable timing does is it, 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 does, it does give you uh, some improvement in fuel economy, but at, you know, at the expense of, of uh, being a little bit, a little bit tougher on the hardware. Um, we haven't had these things long enough to, to know whether the electronic ignition with variable timing has any adverse effect on, on cylinder longevity, for example. Um, I mean, I guess it's theoretically possible that it might, but it, we won't know that for some years to come because the, the the systems haven't been that haven't haven't been out there for that long that we that we have good historical data on it. Stuff like that typically takes a long time because most GA airplanes only fly a hundred hours a year or so, and uh, so to find out what happens you know, at, at TBO or even at a thousand hours is, is, is a, you know, 10 year event. So it takes a long time to, 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 to get data on stuff like that. And we don't really know that yet. And in theory, it's, it's, it's probably a little bit tougher on the, on the hardware, uh, but the, you know, the benefit of the electronic ignition is a better fuel economy, a better starting. There's a lot of advantages to it. So how that all plays out is something we'll, we'll learn in the fullness of time. Well, we're getting close to the end here. Let's wrap it with Kenneth's questions. Any prognostications on engine longevity once GAMI's 100 UL is in wide distribution? and pilots get proficient at proper lean of peak operation? Well, those are two independent uh, values. I think, uh, I, I personally think lean of peak operation uh, definitely extends the life of the engine if it's, if it's done properly, uh, because it's, as I said, it's a, a much gentler combustion event it keeps everything very clean, which really helps with, with things like valve sticking and that sort of thing. Um, as far as G100 UL, um, I, I think that's going to be very good for our engines. I think, uh, I think getting, getting rid of the lead is going to be very helpful because lead deposits are, are a big, big problem uh, for our engines and uh, being able to operate on unleaded fuel, I think, will will prolong the life of the hardware significantly. Um, it's going to be a while before G100 UL is widely available. I'm, you know, I'm guessing it's probably five years uh, because the logistics of getting it out in in large quantities to all of the airports is uh, is a very daunting problem. But I'm looking forward to it. I think it's, uh, uh, I, I, I think it's going to be great. I'm, I'm involved in, uh, in a little test project that AOPA is about to start doing, where they've got a Baron that they're going to be flying around with Hunter low lead and uh, in, on on one side of the airplane and and G100 UL on the other side of the airplane. We're going to be doing comparative uh, engine monitor data analysis and comparative bore scope. Uh, analysis and stuff of, of that airplane. There's another um, fleet project uh, that's, that's about to start up in uh, California that, that we're going to be involved in uh, testing this stuff. Um, but I'm, I, I think it's going to be great. I'll be very happy when it becomes available at my airport. <laughs>
Well, Mike, thank you so much for the great presentation. Looks like we had about over 700 people logged in tonight and uh, many, many great questions. Thank you all for the, for the questions. Take a moment, share closing thoughts with us. Okay, um, if you'd like to receive my monthly newsletter, um, uh, text the word uh, SAVVY, S-A-V-V-Y, to 33777. Um, I think that only works in North America, so if you happen to be uh, listening to this somewhere else in the world, uh, you may not be able to do it that way. You can go to SAVVYAVIATION.COM, and there's a, um, a link at the top of the page to put yourself on our mailing list, or you can uh, check a box on the post-webinar survey that Tim is going to put up as soon as I stop talking, and uh, uh, if you check that box, we'll we'll add you to the list. Um, my uh, four books are available on uh, at, at uh, Amazon, Aircraft Spruce, the EAA Bookstore. The Manifesto book is available as an audio book, and the Engines book will be available as an audio book probably in about a month. I'm just reviewing the 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 last several sections of the book that we've got recorded in audio. And as soon as the review is complete, it's gonna get, uh, it's gonna get uh, uh, posted as, a, as an audio book and available at, uh, through uh, Audible. So I'm excited about that. That's a, that was a big project because that's a 500 page book. Um, our podcast, uh, the, the new issue of it just came out today because it's the first of the month. Ask the A&Ps. It's a podcast that I do with my colleagues, uh, Colleen Sterling and Paul New. Uh, it's uh, basically a, a kind of a call-in show uh, that's modeled after the old NPR car, car talk click and clack program, except that we take questions about airplanes instead of cars and have a lot of fun doing it. If you're interested in participating, that you can get the podcast anywhere you get podcasts, uh, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, et cetera, Overcast. Um, uh, but if you'd like to uh, participate in the podcast and, and ask a question for us to answer, uh, just email a question to podcast at aopa.org and our producer Ian Twombly will schedule you for our recording session. We usually record these things um, about the middle of each month and, and then they get edited and sweetened and music put in the background and everything and, and they wound up uh, they wind up getting released on the first of the next month so the latest issue just get just got released uh, this morning and uh, finally upcoming webinars first wednesday of every month um oh i did something bad here yeah, we I just did I, 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 I didn't roll us over. I'm sorry about that. Uh, man, I screwed up. Well, the, the next two are uh, when in March webinar uh, is called a matter of trust, um, uh, uh, which has to do with with uh, how to to the degree to which uh, an IA who's doing an annual can trust. Uh, what other IA said in, in previous logbook entries and to what degree he has to verify airworthiness himself by personal observation and got into some interesting interesting issues there. And um, um, then the April webinar is is, is uh, interesting one's called Booted Out of Annual. It's a, about a, a, a poor owner of a F-33 Bonanza who put his airplane into an annual inspection and uh, got into a debate with the shop who the, sh the shop was telling him that he had to overhaul his engine and uh, he, he didn't feel he had to and the next thing he knew that the shop threw his airplane out of the shop in pieces and, and, and said don't darken our doorway again and it was the only that that was the only shop on the field so it he came to us and we had to rescue him, but it was a pretty interesting story. The FAA got involved and so on. So it's, a, it's an interesting tale and I'm gonna talk about that. And uh, I, I apologize for not updating this slide correctly, Tim, but I will get you the proper information. <laughs> no problem, Mike. Hey, another fantastic presentation. Thank you so much. Uh, we sure do appreciate you. And to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for joining us, everyone. Have a wonderful evening. 
Good night, everybody.